How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody caffeinated? Anybody need to decaffeinate before we start? We're good? All right. Uh, I'm Ken Colburn. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of the Data Doctors Franchise System and the chair of the, uh, the Technology and Marketing Committee for the IFA. Uh, and uh, the task force, sorry, try not to trip here, uh, the task force that's responsible for putting this session on. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for, for helping support this initiative. This is uh, a couple of years worth of working with the IFA on a kind of a deeper dive conference for those of us that are tasked with actually executing uh, these various technology and marketing strategies that are out there. So we're really grateful that, uh, uh, that they've given us this support. Um, how many people here are here for the first time, have not been to uh, any IFA event uh, ever? Like no conferences, no conventions, no nothing. Okay. How many people have never been to the big conference, the national conference? Okay. I'm just trying to get a sense of, I know we had a lot of people last year as well that were kind of new to this. So those of you that are new to this organization, it's, it's the coolest thing you'll ever experience in that you will see competitors sit down and exchange ideas. This is the most amazing open community I've, I've ever been a part of. So I encourage you to have lots of conversations outside of the, the sessions themselves, because I think there's a lot of value you'll find you'll make some amazing uh, relationships and learn a lot just from, from those conversations. So stop anybody in the hall, say hello, ask them what they're doing. It always leads to a great conversation. So let's, let's uh, keep that in mind as you're going through this. Um, obviously, obviously, we're all dealing with this, uh, this firestorm of technology and change. So really what we're trying to do with this conference is kind of help you with guidance, education, uh, ideas about what's happening. Um, and, but this is a FUBU conference. This is for us, by us. We're, this is our second year, so we're still trying to figure out what the best way to put this on. So your feedback is going to be super, super important. So I want to start with the task force that helped put this together. Everybody that's part of the task force, could you stand up for me? Okay, so these are the folks that basically were responsible for putting, putting this uh, event on this year. So if you have feedback, If you have feedback and ideas, please let us know. We're going to keep asking for that so that next year we're, we're really uh, hitting the mark on the kind of information you're looking for. All right. It is a very interactive event, obviously. Turn off the cell phones, but tweet away. And I think, uh, are we using Frantech 2014? Is that what we decided? Just Frantech is the hashtag. So, so post away if you would, please. Obviously, none of these events can happen without the generous support from our sponsors. And th everybody had a chance to get breakfast and you see our, our Frantech lab in there. So please uh, take the time to thank all the sponsors. I'd, I'd like to recognize them now. The folks from Constant Contact, where are you at? Constant Contact, Franchise Payment Networks, Fran Connect, Bridgeline Digital, Comark Direct, Driven Local, Higher Logic, IFX Online, Local Market Launch, Location 3 Media, Minalto, Placeable, Quigo, Sightly, Skyline, Sprout Loud, and Yodel. Please give, give them all a big hand. Round of applause for that. Again, without them, that, that's really, this, this stuff's not going to happen, so. All right, so let's kind of get right into this. Like I said, this is supposed to be more of a deep dive conference. How many people went to the Tech Summit in, in New Orleans? Okay, so we kind of did a lot of superficial discussions. The committee decided we really need to take a deeper dive into some of these issues that we're all uh, dealing with. So. We want to, oh, by the way, uh, Wi-Fi. Everybody know the Wi-Fi code and pass, uh, the, the Wi-Fi actual name, the SSID and the, the password? You should see a Marriott underscore conf, C-O-N-F, or conference, and the password is Frantech. So if you want to use the, the hotel's Wi-Fi, give that a shot. So we're going to open this session with, I think, a pretty cool deep dive. 
Um, we've got Tim Resnick here from Moz. How many people know who Moz is? The company Moz, great. And the, those, are the, those of you that don't know who Moz is will have a greater appreciation, I think, for what they do. We're going to have Tim come up and really talk about the local search situation and basically, as it says right here, how to dominate the local search landscape. And I'm going to let Tim tell you all about himself and the company. And with that, let's get Tim up here to take a deep dive into local search. How's the sound? Is that pretty good? Everyone can hear me? Yep. I got it, yep. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm honored to be the first speaker uh, and have an hour to talk to you about local search. So we're a little past, uh, I think, 8.30 at this point. Or, so, yeah, so, and my uh, drop dead point is 9.30, so I'm going to try to boogie through this so you can ask some questions at the end. I timed this at about 50 minutes, so we're going to be right on that. But you can see my Twitter handle up there. So if you do have questions, feel free to tweet me, and I'll try to get back to you. So as it says up here, I'm Tim Resnick. I'm from Moz, formerly SEO Moz, and I'm a product strategist there. And in my 12-year history of SEO, I've been really focused on the publishing industry. So working with very large sites, uh, millions of pages, working on the back end, making them very Google friendly and Bing friendly and crawlable, and trying to get those sites to rank for content in order to drive traffic and generate revenue that way. Now I understand we're working with a different model here when it comes to local. We're trying to get the door to swing and the phone to ring. And I've been working on this project or product, Moz Local, for about a year now. Now, traditionally, SEO Moz or Moz has been entirely around just organic search. But about a year and a half ago, we bought a company called Get Listed. Uh, David Mim was the founder of that company. And some of you may have seen him speak down at the IFA uh, convention in New Orleans. So we've been developing this product for a year. And I've been working on the strategy side of it. And I've had a really good opportunity to do some deep diving into what people need to do local optimization. I'm going to share some of that with you today. I'm going to start with a quote. The internet is a breeding ground for false information. Brands are the solution, not the problem. Brands are how you sort out this cesspool. You're going to be very surprised who said this. Maybe some of you know at this point. But I'm not going to tell you now. I'll tell you at the end. As a franchise system, you're in a position to win with brand. That's the good news. But in order to win with brand online, you have to have a really strong foundation for local search optimization. And today, I hope to provide at least a piece of that, a tip of the iceberg for you. Some of you may already have this, but hopefully I add to that to some degree. I want to start with some numbers. Can anyone tell me how many searches per month are conducted on Google? Guess? A lot. <laughs> OK, here's a hint. If you took 14 Earths and the population of the Earth 14 times, that's how many searches per month you would have. 100 billion per month. So every man, woman, and child on Earth would be doing 14 searches. Google's pretty important. That's the moral of that story. How about local searches every month within the US? All right, I won't make you guess. But nearly 7 billion. So for every man and woman in the United States, that's 30 searches per month that has local intent. So that's nearly one search a day for every man and woman. So where is that search happening? Surprisingly, only 20% of local searches are initiated on the desktop, while 50%, 50% are initiated on a mobile internet-enabled device. 
And here's how things are trending. At the end of 2013, mobile accounted for about 15% of all internet traffic. It's projected by the end of 2014, we're going to be somewhere in between 25 and 30%. In fact, recently, Matt Cutts, the head of search at Google at an SMX conference, says that Google projects that 50% of all searches, every single search, will be by a mobile device by the end of the year. 50%. The news is even more compelling when you start looking at where the ad dollars are going. And here, you can really equate ad dollars with the amount of resources people are spending to get the eyeballs on that particular media. And really what this is showing is saturation level in each of these media. So in some of the legacy media, you can see print, the yellow bar in the histogram, only has about 6% of people's time spent reading magazines, newspapers, etc. But nearly 23% of the ad dollars are still going to print. So this doesn't mean that you should stop your legacy advertising campaigns, but you should definitely make sure that you are focused and have a well-balanced uh, organic and paid campaign through these other medias as well. So the internet is still, believe it or not, not entirely saturated from an ad dollar perspective. 26% of people's time is spent online, and only 22% of the total ad dollars are spent there. Now if you look at mobile, this number just blows me away. 12% of people's time is spent on mobile, but only 3% of the ad dollars are spent there. That represents a $20 billion opportunity in ad dollars. And that doesn't mean go out and buy a bunch of ads on mobile, but that does mean there are, there are eyeballs there, that the market has not yet been entirely saturated. So are people actually buying stuff on mobile? Not really. But at the end of 2012, there's about 12 billion in sales on mobile, compared to 226 billion e-commerce sites. So that's pretty small. But if you look at that middle number there, the mobile influence, so the people who are researching online and buying offline, that number is large and continuing to grow. At the end of 2012, it was $158 billion. And it's going to more than triple by the end of 2016, near $700 billion. All right, one more number. 34. So I counted, and this is the number of actual optimization tips for franchisors or franchisees in this presentation. Are you going to use every single one? Probably not. But I hope that you use a handful. And I hope it at least gets the juices flowing a little bit and creates some questions. All right, we're going to go manual. Oh, it's not even a Windows machine. I'm not sure what's happening. All right, let's see. Wow. All right, so PowerPoint crashed. Just give me a second to open this back up. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Good point. I should have been using Keynote, I suppose. Sorry, it's really hard to actually see the cursor. This stuff always happens live, of course. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to kind of go fast and furious. I'm going to provide a lot of information. So I'm going to provide this roadmap to make sure that we, stick on, we stay on track and we know where we are and we don't get too lost. So first I'm going to talk about what is local optimization for search and why it's so complicated. I understand that the, uh, the level of technical savvy and expertise here is probably higher than at other conferences. Um, but I want to make sure I build a foundation. So 
we're all talking about the same thing. I'm going to go through five local optimization steps that are laden with a ton of tips. And then finally, how to leverage the strengths of your franchise system, specifically the brand. First, to describe local search, I want to take a step back and talk about organic search on the simplest of levels. And again, this is where most of my experience comes in, so I'm very familiar with it. Google has made its money through organic search, and they were the first ones really to use links as the ranking factor. And it's still the most powerful ranking factor. So they look at the links, they look how many links are coming into your site, where those links are coming from, what's the authority of the site that's linking to you, and what's the relevancy. And they build a trust profile or authority profile on your site and on your page. Then they're actually looking at stuff on your page. So what's in the code, what's in the text, what images do you have? And based on what the user's searching for, they rank you. So Google is really just trying to answer the question, how relevant and authoritative are you for a specific topic? Local is a little more complicated. So don't try to read this. It might make you dizzy. Organic is a little simpler because everything exists within a digital world. Google crawls the web, they see, see the links, they understand what's on your page, and they can make sense of it. In the local ecosystem, when someone does a search, Google first wants to know, does your business really exist? Can they trust you? They want to be able to connect what your business does with what the searcher is looking for, obviously, provide a good user experience. And they want to make sure you're in the right geographic location. And so there's a lot going on here. Not only are, are they crawling the web like they do with traditional search, but they're also using information from data aggregators across the web. And having your information here and having your information be consistent is key to ranking highly in local search. So I want to back up a little bit and start just with the basic terms that I'm going to use today to make sure we're all on the same page. Speaking of which, on-page optimization. When I say that, what do I mean? So it's just pertaining to content or source code that's already on your site. And the great news about on-page is that we're in control. This is our site. Not only is it we're in control, but it's also our responsibility as the manager of the franchise system to do this really well and to make sure Google can crawl the page, understands what the content is about, and then you need to be able to provide that information to the user and also provide it to Google. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about like source stuff in the code, HTML code, like the title tag, um, the H1 heading, which is what Google considers to be the most important heading. And then also, of course, the content. The content really matters. So when you hear me say Google Plus local page, it's also what has formerly been called Google Places. Is this the page that's specifically on Google Plus that is a representation of your business? And these are unique from other business pages in that they actually represent a physical business. So you're going to have your name on there, your phone number, your address. But it's different from places pages because you can actually connect with people. You can put them in your circles. They can put you in their circles. You can post. You can participate in Hangouts, et cetera. So they're pretty powerful. How many of you are familiar with this term? OK. So at least half of you. So Nat refers to name, address, and phone number. If you see a W on the end, that's website. So what is this? This is essentially your digital footprint for your business online. And one of the most important factors for ranking in local search. With the NAP come citations. So citations are a mention or a partial mention of your business name or your NAP. 
and the quality of the quality of these, so where you're getting these citations and the quantity are really important. But what's even more important is the consistency. If Google sees a bunch of different phone numbers for that same business name in that location or a different zip code or different address, they're not going to trust you as much and it's going to it's going to affect your rankings. The local knowledge graph is a collection of structured data. So data about your business that is visually represented in the search result like this. You own this area. This is your area. You have control over it by controlling your Google Plus local page. So what are the most important ranking factors for local? Now, of course, Google's a black box. We don't really know what the most important ranking factors are. But there's a lot of smart people who do local search optimization. So at Moz, we did a poll of 40 of those people. That's all they do, that is local search optimization. We asked them, what are the most important ranking factors? What ranking factors are the most important to be competitive? What ranking factors are the most important when you're just starting your business? And consistently, these were the top three. Number one, your Google Plus local page. Number two, external signals. So that would be citations, that would be directory listings, and how your name is actually distributed throughout the internet. And number four, actual on-page signals, the signals that are on your web page. Let me give you a few examples of each. So no one knows exactly how many total ranking factors there are. In our survey, we had 87. That came up. I'm going to just show you about four or five. I'm sure Google has hundreds, if not thousands. So some signals that are very important on your Google Plus profile page, most important thing are your categories and making sure you have the right categories picked. The actual address that you have on your Google Plus page matches the address or the city where the searcher is. And then the completeness of your actual profile page. Do you have your hours? Do you have your photo in there or photos? Do you participate on Google Plus? These are important signals. External signals. The consistency of your name, address, and phone number through citations across the web. The quality and authority of those citations. And of course, the quantity of those citations. So the things that you control, your on-page signals. Making sure that your name, address, and phone number is in HTML on your page, and it's matching your Google Plus local profile. That is probably the most important connection when we talk about consistency, is at least on your site and your Google Plus site is matching. Of course, we want it to match everywhere else, but this is a good place to start. Making sure that the local business title, so that unit level local business title, is in the title tag on the page. And making sure there are actual location and geographic signals within that title tag as well. Google wants consistent and correct information because the users want consistent and correct information. Other important factors that we found in this study. Link signals, of course. It's the foundation of Google, as I mentioned. Where it comes in, in this scenario, in local, and specifically in a franchise system, is Google can have a really hard time figuring out parent-child brand relationships. But it, your links can help. So if you have your brand name in the link going to your specific unit level with that parent brand name, they can make that association semantically. And it's going to ultimately help. Social si signals, of course. How much are people talking about that local business online? Review signals. I'd be remiss not to mention that. 
behavioral signals. So what I mean here is when someone does a search on Google and they go to your local business from Google, what's happening? What's happening in that click stream? Do they immediately hit the back button and go back to Google and do another search, signifying that they haven't found what they want? If so, Google's going to take that into account in how they rank your site. And then, of course, personalization. Search engine result pages look different all the time based on personalization, based on your search history, based on, obviously, your geographic location, but also based on what your friends are posting on Google+. So I did a test a couple weeks ago. And I had David Mim. He's, he's the one running Moz Local. I had him post a link on Google+, about the NCAA tournament. Literally 15 to 20 seconds later, I did a search on Google. Can't remember the exact search frame, uh, phrase. It was something very generic that he would never rank for. It was like NCAA tournament. And the link that he posted on Google+, came up, annotated, that he shared it on Google+. Now that's very, very powerful. So for a local business, what that means is if you're creating content and people are sharing that on Google+, people within their circles that are doing, doing searches that relate to that content are now going to see your content, even if it's a term that's very hard to rank for organically. So there's power in personalization that we can take advantage of. All right. So hopefully we, we're all on the same page, level playing field of what local search is, which leads us into our next section of talking about how to actually optimize for local search. And this is where the bulk of the presentation is, and it's, it'll hopefully get pretty fast and furious. So I've made another roadmap to make sure everyone's following along. We're going to talk about your internal site structure and things that you can do to make it easily crawled by Google. We're going to talk about optimizing your Google Plus local page. We're going to talk about removing friction from the review process, making it easier for your customers and your franchisee customers to leave reviews. We're going to kind of brush over data. It's really important to talk about it because we can only make good decisions of where to put our resources if we're looking at the data and to see if we're successful in our efforts and campaigns. And then finally, we're going to talk about the distribution of your name, address, and phone number. So getting your structure right. There's two elements that are very important. Your store locator and then the actual page of your location. And I'll go over both here. So this is for a tire center uh, that serves the Northwest and West called Les Schwab. It might even be in Colorado. I'm not sure. They have this locator page, which I think looks fantastic. It has a map. It automatically recognizes that I was in downtown Portland when I, when I uh, came to this page. And they show me a bunch of locations on a map. So it's great for the user, not so great for the crawler. It's in JavaScript. Google's not really good at crawling and understanding JavaScript and the content that's within it and the links that are within it. They've gotten better over the years, but definitely not ideal. So what are we trying to do here? Your website is a portal, not only for your customers, but also for the search spiders. They're jumping into your site, and they're looking at the links, and they want to crawl those links to see what content you have. If you put all of your locations in a JavaScript map, how in the world is Google going to know that you have all these locations? They're not, and that's a problem. This is an example of a really great store locator page. It balances form for the user, very easy to navigate, very easy to find your store, and function for the crawler. 
Let me give you two examples. At the top here, they have links directly to their store directory. And if you click on that, what you're going to see is one big page of HTML links of every single one of their stores. So what does that mean? That means Google hits REI.com, and in the footer or the header, they have a link to their store locator. So every page Google hits, they're seeing that store locator. And they're jumping to it. And they're only one more click away, click away from getting to that store directory and seeing every single store. So maximum depth is only two clicks away for the user and for Google. So that makes it really clean and easy for Google to crawl your site. So it's essentially like an HTML sitemap. So you can, you could do it this way, which I recommend, and you can also add it to your HTML sitemap and add it to your XML sitemap. I love this as well. So essentially what they're doing here is they're alerting the spiders that, hey, we have some new content, and they're moving it a level up from that directory page. And these new stores that are coming online are going to need a little extra bump. So they're taking that authority that they have, which this page probably has more authority than that directory level page, and they're passing a little bit of that equity on to these new stores to help them along. As I mentioned, the second thing is really getting your store pages right. Making sure that you have NAP information in HTML. Making sure you have rich content on the pages and that you're cross-linking and letting Google know these pages exist. All right, so say you have a relatively small franchise system of 20 units. How many pages do you need for those 20 units? Anyone? <laughs> Divided by two. You need 20 separate pages. You need one page per unit. If you try to put multiple units on a page, it's not going to have that individual footprint that you need and that individual signal for that store that you need. So this is paramount. Also recommend putting it on the same domain and putting these pages in separate folders. If you have to put them in subdomains, if that is how your architecture works, it's OK. It's not ideal. It'll work. But definitely don't have all your stores on their own domains. And there might be some edge cases where that makes sense. But you're going to lose a lot of that equity and a lot of that advantage that you have as a franchise system in centralizing that brand and centralizing and aggregating that equity on one domain. So as I mentioned, cross-linking is very important. Google gets to know your content by crawling links on your site and crawling links across the web. So if there's no link to a page, Google's never going to find it. So don't orphan your pages. You've you got to make sure you link to them. And you don't want to overlink to them, but do it in a natural way. That's good for the user. And if it's good for the user, ultimately it's going to be good for the search engines as well. Here's an example. So you have a basic website with products and locations. Why not link to locations from those products? Not necessarily every single location, but some of your top locations. Or if you can recognize by IP where someone is and be confident that you think they really are in that location, serve them the stores that are close to them. And link to your stores. Pass some of that equity from those product pages to your store pages. Pass some of the equity from your location pages to your product pages. Let's get into some specific examples of optimizing the unit level page. Obviously, this isn't a real website. <laughs> um, this is uh, a mock-up of Blue Widget Company. 
with some locations in Portland, Oregon. And specifically, this is the Southeast Hawthorne location. So first, make sure that the title tag, the title tag is in the HTML code with the tag called title. Make sure that, and the user sees it on the, uh, on the browser bar, make sure that has the Google Plus local business title. So if you call yourself Blue, Blue Widgets Inc. Portland in Google Plus, name it the same thing here. Make that connection. The URL should be short, but also include the city name. Include other location information if you can. But as uh, someone who's probably in the room that I met last night, Chad, said, you don't want your URL going into tomorrow. Keep it short and succinct. Your H1 title is also very important. So the heading uh, within the code that is in the tags, H1. Make sure that that also matches your business title name on Google+. Include the Google Places map. It's good for the users. It's good for that extra connection for Google. Ask people for reviews and make it really easy for them to go and leave those reviews from that site. Now, that's not ultimately going to increase the, the power of this page from a, a ranking perspective, but reviews ultimately will. Again, cross-link to other stores near that location. Cross-link to products offered in that store. So not only do you want to have your name, address, and phone number in HTML, mark it up with structured data format that Google understands. And what they have set as their standard for structured data is schema.org. And here's what it looks like in the code. Looks more complicated than it is. Essentially, you're just taking each one of these elements and setting an attribute to it that's within the structured data format of schema. And schema specifically has structured data around local business. So this is great. So you can put your name in there and tell Google, like, hey, this is a local business, and this is my name, and here's my address information, and here is the map on your site that relates specifically to my business. It's just another strong signal that you're legit. So this one's kind of out there, but I like it. Add Google Plus authorship to improve click-through rate on these pages. This is what authorship looks like to the user. Google wants to be able to connect a piece of content to someone on Google+. And when they can make that relationship, they put a nice picture up there. And that picture can increase click-through rate up to 35%. So in this example, Barbara runs a jewelry shop in New York. None of her competitors get a picture, but she does. That is much more likely to get clicked. An implementation for this is surprisingly easy. The business rules that you have within your franchise system may not be this easy, but I'm using the example of a branch manager. So if you have a branch manager and you, you're comfortable with using him or her as the face of the brand, what you would do is use their Google Plus profile and from that location page, link to their Google Plus profile with this attribute, rel author. So that's step one. Step two is your branch manager goes into their Google Plus profile page and in their uh, uh, editing their profile, they need to go to this contributor to section and tell Google, hey, I actually contribute to this website Blue Widgets over here. And now Google's making this connection of this author or this branch manager and this piece of content. And you're likely to get that authorship 
in the search result. It can be very, very powerful. And I bet most of your competitors aren't doing it, so it's going to put you at an advantage. Make sure each of your unit level pages is unique. This is an example of how not to do it. Sorry, Dairy Queen. Their name, address, and phone number, it's in an image. Google can't crawl it. They have a map, so that's good, but there's nothing else telling Google this is a unique page. In publishing, when we're dealing with millions of pages with uh, parameters in the URL, you have the problem of duplicate content. Google does not like duplicate content. It's a bad user experience to do a search and see a bunch of the same content on different URLs for the same site. So they have very sophisticated filters to knock this stuff out of there. This is likely to get knocked out. This is a great example of how to do it. Good job, REI. So they have about 50 words at the top here, not to mention a unique H1 for that location. But they're actually describing the location. They have their name, address, phone number. They even put the GPS coordinates in there. A little geek cred, I suppose. And then links specific to the shop and an image. Now, this is a unique page. Google's going to crawl this page and say, hey, this is, a, this is something that is unique on the web. And this, I'm going to trust this location more than something like Dairy Queen, for example. Back to Dairy Queen, but this time I'm going to praise them. Rel Publisher is a lot like Rel Author. It's making that association to a Google Plus profile in your web page. But in this case, it's to the brand, not to an author. And what you get for this is you get a little extra in your branded search results. Now, while it's not a lot, we should take what's given to us and own this real estate. And the only way you can own that is by implementing Rel Publisher. Again, it's a connection between your website and Google+. And it's really as simple as this. It looks like garbly good, but let me tell you what it is. In the head of your HTML document, all you need to do is link to your Google Plus profile, your main brand profile, so not your location profile, but your main brand as a franchisor or franchise, and then put the attribute rel publisher. And then Google's going to say, OK, this website over here is really this profile over here. I'm going to provide all this great extra data in the search result for them. All right. That was the, definitely the heaviest one. We're at about 30 minutes. So I think, I think we'll get through this in about 20 minutes, talking about local Google Plus page optimization next. So again, the survey that we did. What was the absolute most important ranking factor? Consensus was making sure you had your categories right on your Google Plus page. So you're prompted, when you, when you go into a review site, you're prompted to choose anywhere from two to 10 categories. And it's a very, very important step. So search engines consider your business listing as primary relevant for a set of keywords that relate to your categories. So if you're, if you're miscategorized or you don't have the right category in there, you're at a disadvantage competitively. Here's a free tool you can use on our site at Moz Local. In fact, if you go to uh, moz.com local uh, slash local slash zores, you'll find a lot of great information that was specifically put up for you guys. And you'll, you'll have a link to this. And what this is going to do, it's going to look through all the different review sites and tell you what categories there are. So you can compare and make sure that if you're a pizza restaurant, you're not categorizing yourself as an Italian restaurant necessarily. And if you're more of a restaurant, you know, don't categorize yourself as takeaway. If you have multiple categories, of course you can add those as secondary and tertiary categories. 
but just do a little research up front. Do a little keyword research. Uh, Google Trends is great for doing keyword research. Google AdWord Planner is great for keyword research to see what people are actually searching for. Do people search more for pizza delivery or pizza takeaway? Just spend 5, 10, 20 minutes researching it and it'll go a long way. Own your local knowledge graph. And the only way to own your knowledge graph, again, this is, this is your real estate. It's your responsibility, or perhaps your franchisee's responsibility, to make sure this information is filled out. I would recommend centralizing this process, but all systems are different. Make sure the hours are there. A lot of people leave out the hours. And then, make sure you have the right images. Guess what Google does when you don't have images in your profile? They're crawling your site, and they're looking for images. This particular company had a WordPress installation and a directory full of great images from a party they had. And this is how they're representing themselves online, which maybe they want to. I mean, after all, it is Portland. All right, let's talk about removing some of the friction from the review process. This is supposed to be a very annoying flowchart, because this is what your users have to go through if you ask them to leave you a review. They first come to your site. They navigate to your actual business page, like on Yelp, for example. And then if they don't have an account already, they have to sign up for one. Complete a profile. Wait for an email to come. Confirm their account. And then finally, if you're lucky, they're going to leave a review. Usually, they're going to drop out. 95% of people are going to drop out there and end up not doing it. There's a lot of friction. Here's a few ways to make it easier. Link to review sites that allow Facebook logins or Google Plus logins, which would obviously be just Google. But if you, if you link to these sites, people are already logged into Facebook. They're posting on Facebook all day. They're most likely already logged in. It's three steps. They go to your direct, they go to you, they click on a link, they leave a review. Thanks to uh, Phil Rozick, uh, a great local SEO who made this graphic. And you can get the full graphic here. Um, and by the way, I'm going to post this whole slide presentation up on SlideShare, and then I'll, I'll tweet it out. So you can download it and get all these links and get everything. So here's all of the review sites that accept Facebook logins. Send them there. Well, health grade's not, but that's very vertical related, obviously. And just FYI, here's, here's the sites that are OK with you asking people to leave reviews. As many of you know, Yelp has some pretty strict policies around it, but mostly everyone else is OK. Here's another idea. Segment your email database. So go into your, your database and look for users that have signed up for a newsletter or that you've captured uh, at point of sale. And look for users who have a Gmail account. If they have a Gmail account, just send them a direct link to your Google Plus local page and ask for a review. They're most likely logged into Google already. It's not a lot of friction there. And then for all of those who do not, Send them somewhere that accepts Facebook, Bing, Yahoo, et cetera. All right, so we've talked about these general directories and reducing the friction of getting reviews there. These are the directories that matter for no matter what type of business you are. Yelp, Yahoo, Yellow Pages, City Search, Google. But there are, of course, vertical directories that are going to be very important depending on what, which vertical and industry you operate. Here's a way to find some. Search for something you want to rank for. General contractors in Portland, for example. The first two results here are organic results, organic directories, house.com and thumbtack.com. 
Google's crawling in these sites, and they're telling you right here, they consider them important for this particular search. You'll want to get reviews there. Further down on the page, you have the local pack. Go through every single one of these and pull up the local knowledge graph for each business, and you're going to see more reviews. So Google's essentially telling you, we crawled these reviews and find them relevant for this particular search. You'd be very wise to go to these and make sure your name, address, and phone number are correct, you've claimed your listing, and you get reviews. So you gotta be honest with yourself. I'm, you know, I'm giving you a lot of tips today. Maybe you'll go out and execute some of them. But you can't do it blindly. Some of them cost money, like distribution of your, of your listings costs money. All of them take time. All of them take a lot of organization. You're in a very complicated system. You need to understand your data to be able to make those good decisions moving forward. And I could give an hour-long presentation just on this, but I wanted to at least let you walk away with a few of the top things that I recommend. So first, when you're optimizing your own site, it's best to see how Google sees your site. Now this is the closest look we'll ever get into the black box. Google's basically giving you webmaster tools to see how they see your site. What errors are they finding? Where are they having problems crawling your site and indexing information? You can get index status, so understand how much Google is crawling your site, how often. You can see if that matches the total number of pages that you have. And if it doesn't, you might have a problem. You can look for potential problems with duplicate content. You can make sure that your site maps are up to date and don't have errors. And this is free, and it's very, very easy to implement. If you have uh, any experience in deploying a single HTML static web page, you could do this in a couple minutes. So you definitely want it if you don't already have it. So. As many of you may know, for the last year, Google has steadily been removing the referral keyword. Uh, I met Deb from Sprout Loud yesterday, and she informed me, and this was news to me, that Google's actually going to stop letting marketers know the keyword from AdWords as well. So our data is becoming more limited in terms of our referral data from Google. But there's still things that are very powerful. And I'm going to get into something more technical. For those of you who use Google Analytics or uh, Web Analytics right now, um, this will probably make a lot of sense. For those of you who do not, just bear with me. All right. I'm going to show you how to do advanced segmentation two pieces of basic advanced segmentation within Google Analytics that'll help you understand where your local traffic's coming from so you can make good decisions. Oops. All right, so you log into your Google Analytics page you see you get a bunch of traffic. If you look at all your referrals, it's great. You can see you know, where that traffic's coming from. But we want to segment this. So you go up to advanced segmentation, you create a new segment. And in this case, we're going to name our segment. You can, you can see you can do a bunch of different stuff, but like segmentation by age, by gender, language, uh, geography, traffic sources. Here we just want to look at our local traffic from Google. So you want to filter by source. So what source is sending you that information and the URL of that source? And here we're going to key on maps.google.com. So what traffic am I actually getting to my site that, generate, that was originated from maps? 
Now I want to add another condition here that grabs all my traffic from plus.url.google.com, which is Google+. And when you save that, what you're going to see is a segment. So you get one segment here, you'll see in a second, local Google. So it, it, it um, rolls it all up into one view. Now, let's grab our other local traffic. So I'm going to call this local, just aggregated or aggregate. Again, keying off the source. This time I'm going to use a little, I'm going to use a regular expression, which I won't go into detail exactly how to use it here. All you need to know for this is that a pipe bar means or. So again, you want to put your source information. So let's say I run a site that has some Zagat traffic. Um, you can put Zagat in here, City Search. You can put Yelp. So basically what I'm saying here is return me everything that has Zagat or City Search or Yellow Pages or Yelp or just local or just maps. So I get a little bit of traffic there. And if I save it, now what I'm going to see is two segments. So I have local, Google, and then aggregate local. Now I can start using that to make decisions. If I've set up goals, conversion goals, I can start cutting my data in this way. How many conversions am I getting for traffic specifically from Google local versus the other aggregators? And then of course you can dive into detail to see what's happening from those specific referrals as well. So kind of basic high level uh, overview of advanced segmentation. But use Google Analytics or use a web analytics platform and make sure you use it to its full ability because these are very robust tools that can provide a lot of information even though we no longer have keywords with our referral data. All right, so we're nearing towards the end of this section. And full disclosure, this is a little salesy. I try not to do too much selling in my presentations, but we did just release a product, Moz Local, and um, it's uh, you know part of the reason that I'm here, and I would like to introduce you to it. There's also a lot of other great services out there that provide this service. So one of them happens to be placeable, and this is from a survey that they've done recently. 73% of the people that they surveyed, about 1,000 people, small sample but still significant, 73% of those people lost trust in a brand when the listings are incorrect or inconsistent. Okay. How much time? Okay. Up to 40% of business listings have inconsistent data. So this is an opportunity for you. A lot of your competitors probably suck at this. You need to get all your NAP information distributed to these places because they're all Google Local, Google Plus Local sources. The more consistent your data is here, the better off you're going to be in ranking. So this is how we do it. We send information to InfoGroup and make sure it's consistent because they send to different people than New Star Local Ease does. We send it to Axiom. We send it through Factual. And then we also push that data, because we can't forget about mobile, of course, to Apple Maps. So you can do this yourself. A lot of these ha are, like Axiom is up to five listings for free. But once you're past that, it's 50 bucks. InfoGroup is the same logic. And you can go and do this yourself for all your locations. It takes time. Or we can do it for you. And basically how it works is you sign up for Moz Local. Your franchise owner submits the data to corporate. That data is formatted. They opt into the program. And then all you really do is once a year upload this spreadsheet. Or if the information changes, go in and change this information. It's 50 bucks per listing. And we go in and we do all this for you. All right, that's my pitch. Um, I'm running out of time, but I do want to finish talking about the strength of the franchise system. 
In the simplest form, your system may look like this. But more likely, it's something like that. But you want Google to see it as this. And there's some inherent strengths in a distributed model that you guys are operating under. You have the power of brand. And you have the ability to provide that to your franchisees. But with that comes, obviously, great responsibility. As someone who's pro providing a service to a franchisee, it is your responsibility to build that brand and to protect that brand. You also have budget, more budget than your franchisees, and scale. Well, maybe I'm making an assumption. So what does this mean in terms of responsibilities? Create brand guidelines. Provide parameters for the franchisees to operate under. Do what you can on the back end with a locator, providing markup like authorship and publisher, signing up for services like Moz Local and helping them make sure that their information is consistent, and then, of course, support. I love the distributed model because you get the advantage of having people in that location. You have boots on the ground. You get a face to the brand. And you can leverage that. Local social media campaigns, having very hyper-local specific content that can drive traffic that you're never going to be able to create on a corporate level, and helping with the review programs. You'll see here I have an asterisk. You want to give them the opportunity to build their unit or units, but under guidelines, under support and a system that nurtures the brand. Again, the internet is a breeding ground for false information. Brands are the solution, not the problem. Brands are how you sort out the cesspool. Eric Schmidt, Google. He said this when he was the CEO in 2009. And I think a lot of it has proven to be true with the steps they've taken towards RHEL Publisher, with the, with the steps they've to taken with Google Plus, and using that as an authentication platform for brand. And as a franchise and running a franchise system, this is awesome news for you. Because this is your strength. You're extremely well positioned to scale your brand at a global level and then fortify it at a local level with boots on the ground. Ultimately, getting the door to swing and the phone to ring. Thank you very much.